The Mutiny on the Bounty and Life at Pitcairn Island The Bounty had a single mission in support of an experiment, it was to travel to Tahiti, pick up breadfruit plants, and transport them to the West Indies, in the hopes they would grow well there, and become a cheap source of food for slaves. But this would later prove to be a mistake, because when the breadfruit was given as food to the slaves, they absolutely refused to eat it. In 1787, Lieutenant William Bly was selected to command the bounty and the first crewman he recruited was Fletcher Christian, a friend with whom he'd sailed before. But from the very start, the mission got into trouble, it was delayed and didn't leave England for several weeks after its planned departure. The raining season in Tahiti would delay the gathering of the plant with several months if they did not reach Tahiti in time. This would later have dire consequences for the ship and its crew. The bounty left England on December 23, 1787, on a course for Tahiti around the southern tip of South America. Captain Blight had gotten the permission to try to round the Cape Horn, in order to save time and hopefully reach Tahiti to collect the breadfruit, before the raining season began. For a full month, they attempted to round Cape Horn, but the weather blocked all attempts they made. Bly had to give up, and ordered the ship to turn around, and proceeded east, rounding the Cape of Good Hope, a 10,000-mile detour, past Africa and Australia. During the voyage, Bly demoted the ship's sailing master, John Fryer, replacing him with Fletcher Christian. This act seriously damaged the relationship between Bly and Fryer, and Fryer would later claim Bly's act was entirely personal. The bounty reached Tahiti on October 26, 1788, after ten months at sea. Shipboard drudgery turned to partying in a few minutes as canoes of friendly Tahitians converged on the ship. Bly later wrote in his journal, I could scarce find my own people for all the Tahitians there. For the men aboard the bounty, who had been at sea for such a long time and whom many had never been outside England before, it must have seemed like they had just reached paradise. The Tahitians were a very friendly people and their culture meant that exchanging bodily fluids with foreign guests was a customary thing to do. And the English sailors were, unsurprisingly eager to get to know the local beauties better. The bounty had arrived far later than intended, and the start of the rainy season meant that the ship would have to remain anchored off the island for five months before the breadfruit plants would be ready to go. Bly's relations with the natives were cordial, and he loved the place, as this entry in his log makes clear. Matavai Bay is certainly the paradise of the world, and if happiness could result from situation and convenience, here it is to be found in the highest perfection. I have seen many parts of the world, but Odahite, as Tahiti was called back then, is capable of being preferable to them all. For the first few months, everything was good, with the crew enjoying the welcoming nature of the Tahitians, particularly the women, meaning, they got to have lots of sex while the breadfruit saplings grew. But as we know, Adam and Eve's days in paradise didn't last forever, and the trouble started with Captain Bly, not being able to not live up to his tyrannical reputation. Bly was furious that the spare sails had rotted, and he lamented the loss of crew discipline in his logs, which became lists of grievances, real or imagined, with his crew. He made Fletcher Christian the target of many of his tantrums. Christian was routinely humiliated by the captain, often in front of the crew and the native Tahitians, for petty things or just made-up accusations. One sailor reported, whatever fault was found, Mr. Christian was sure to bear the brunt. Floggings, rarely administered during the outward voyage, now became a common occurrence. As a consequence of Bly's behavior, three sailors and a box of weapons went missing in January. When the men were found three weeks later, they were whipped and chained in irons. As the date for the departure from the island came closer, Bly's outbursts and anger towards his officers became more frequent. Tensions rose among the men who faced the prospect of a long and dangerous voyage, with many months of hard sailing. 
Bly was impatient to leave, and with about 1,000 breadfruits safely on board, the bounty was readied for its departure after 23 weeks in Tahiti. But many of the men did not share Bly's interest in leaving their island paradise behind, but on the early afternoon of April 5th, the ship sailed west. On April 21st, Christian complained to Bly that he had been in hell for weeks due to the latter's behavior. He endured more abuse at the hands of his commanding officer three days later, being called a cowardly rascal after the crew's gathering of fresh water on the island Anamuka had to be abandoned when natives attacked them. It got so bad that Christian contemplated escaping the bounty on a makeshift raft, a move which would have been very close to suicide. The final straw was pulled on April 27, when Bly claimed that some coconuts were missing from the pile and he announced that he would find and punish the coconut thief. According to crewman James Morrison, Christian responded to Bly's interrogation of him by saying, I hope you don't think me guilty of stealing. Bly answered, Yes, you damned hound I do. You must have stolen them from me or you could give a better account of them. He ended the confrontation with orders that rations for yams would be cut in half. Christian was left devastated by the incident and William Purcell reported that Christian left Bly with tears, running fast from his eyes in big drops. Before dawn on April 28, Bly awoke to the sight of Christian and three others, all armed. The four of them hauled Bly, in his nightshirt, out of his quarters and onto the deck. When Bly entreated Christian to be reasonable, Christian would only reply, I am in hell, I am in hell. Despite strong words and threats on both sides, the ship was taken bloodlessly and without struggle by any of the loyalists, except Bly himself. Of the 42 men on board, aside from Bly and Christian, 18 joined the mutiny, 2 were passive, and 22 remained loyal to Bly. The mutineers did provide the loyalists with some supplies, including water, bread, sails, and tools, though Bly's request for guns was laughed at. But four loyalists were forced to stay with the 18 mutineers, because the boat Bly was given, didn't have room for more people, the same happened to the two crew members who had been passive. Bly and his crew headed for Tofua to augment their meager provisions. The only casualty during this voyage was a crewman, John Norton, who was stoned to death by natives of Tofua. Finally, 48 days after being kicked off the bounty, Bly and his men reached Timor. A journey they had done only equipped with a quadrant, a pocket watch and with no charts or compass, which is very impressive. Lieutenant Bly returned to Britain and reported the mutiny to the Admiralty on March 15, 1790 two years and eleven weeks after leaving England. Christian and the other mutineers sailed the bounty to Tubuai. And there, it must have seemed to the crew that they'd found a new idyllic paradise and they first dropped anchor, as a few native men led eighteen young, beautiful women on board the bounty to greet the visitors. However, hundreds of men in fifty canoes lay in wait nearby. It ended with the bounty driving the natives off with cannon and musket fire, killing eleven people and earning the location the name of Bloody Bay. Despite the skirmish, Christian still hoped to settle on Tubuai, though the bounty first returned to Tahiti. Tahiti, paradise though it was, would also surely be visited by more Englishmen searching for the mutineers. They could therefore not stay there for a long time. When the mutineers returned to Tahiti with the bounty, in order to explain why they returned to the island, they said to the Tahitians that Captain Bly and Captain Cook was founding a settlement in Aitutaki. Captain Cook was well known and liked by the islanders and they believed the story the mutineers told them. The mutineers then sailed for the island of Tubuai, bringing with them some Tahitians, where they tried to settle. After three months of being attacked by the island's natives, they gave up and they returned to Tahiti once again. On the return to Tahiti, the welcome they got was much colder than previously. 
The Tahitians had learned from the crew of a visiting British ship that the story of Captain Cook and Bly founding a settlement in Aitutaki was false, and that Captain Cook had been dead for a long time. Fletcher Christian now worried that the Tahitians might react with anger over their false story and turn violent. He therefore didn't want to stay long. The mutineers had a vote, and sixteen men voted to stay in Tahiti and take their chances, both with the Tahitians, but also with the eventual British ship that would come looking for them. Whereas Christian and eight others wanted to leave. Christian allowed fifteen of the sixteen men ashore from the bounty, but Joseph Coleman was detained on the ship, as Christian needed his skills as an armorer. The remaining mutineers would barely be able to sail the ship, but Christian had an idea on how to fix that. He invited some Tahitians on board the bounty. They feasted and had a good time, but suddenly Fletcher Christian and the other mutineers set the ship a-sail and departed without warning. Six Tahitian men, nineteen women, and one baby had essentially been kidnapped. The number of captives was soon reduced when one woman, upon seeing that the bounty was sailing away from her home, jumped overboard and swam for shore. Six elderly women were later let off the boat at Maria, but the rest of the Tahitians were stuck with Christian and his men. The bounty, abductees and all, set off in search of an isolated place to settle, exploring around the Cook Islands, Tonga, and the eastern parts of Fiji over the ensuing months. Starting to grow desperate, Christian turned to Bly's books and found an account written by Philip Carteret about an island he'd spotted in 1767 and named Pitcairn. Captain Cook had been unable to find Pitcairn on two separate voyages, so Christian concluded that Carteret must have recorded the wrong longitude on the map. He took the bounty to Pitcairn's latitude and headed east, and Pitcairn was found in January 1790. After the decision was made to settle on Pitcairn, Christian's group offloaded everything of value from the bounty and then ran it aground in what would eventually be known as Bounty Bay. About a week later, the ship was burned, an act which probably was performed by Matthew Quintal. Fletcher Christian wanted to preserve the ship, but Matthew reportedly said, No, we shall be discovered. And now, no one, not Fletcher Christian, not the mutineers, and not the Tahitians, was going anywhere, they were marooned on Pitcairn Island. In March 1790, Bly returned to England, where he faced an automatic court-martial for losing the bounty. The Admiralty believed Bly's story on what had happened, and he was declared innocent of any wrongdoing. He was in fact, hailed as a hero, and soon received his next command. But, Bly would be mutinied against again, not once, but two more times. Which I believe must be a record for number of mutinies, for one single captain. But if you know of someone with more mutinies than that, please let me know in the comments section below. The HMS Pandora, under the command of Captain Edward Edwards, was sent to search for the bounty and the mutineers. The vessel arrived at Tahiti in March 1791, and when seeing this, three of the remaining mutineers, homesick for England, swam right out to it. They were chained up, despite their voluntary surrender. From these men, Edwards learned of Christian's departure, as well as the fact that two of the mutineers on the island had since been murdered. Matthew Thompson shot Charles Churchill, and was later stoned to death by Churchill's Tahitian family in an act of revenge. Ten days later, all of the eleven remaining mutineers on Tahiti had been brought aboard the Pandora and locked in a specially made cell, dubbed of course, Pandora's Box. The Pandora left Tahiti, spending about three months visiting islands to the west of Tahiti in search of the bounty and the remaining mutineers, without finding anything. They then headed west through the Torres Strait, but the Pandora ran aground on part of the Great Barrier Reef in August 1791. The ship sank and 31 of the crew and four of the prisoners drowned. The Pitcairn Island community began life with bright prospects. There was enough food, water and land for the small community. Although many of the Polynesians were homesick, 
and the Britons knew they were marooned on Pitcairn forever, they settled into life on Pitcairn fairly quickly. The mutineers divided up the land and built their houses behind screens of vegetation to further protect themselves from the prying eyes of any passing ship. Christian had married one of the women, Mimetai, back in Tahiti, and each of the other British men took a Tahitian woman for themselves. The six Tahitian men were treated almost as slaves and quarreled over the three women left to them. Tensions flared and two of the mutineers' women died, at which point they each claimed another woman. Upset by this, two of the Tahitian men then hatched a plan to kill the mutineers. But one of the women ratted them out, leading to their murder instead. On September 20, 1793, the Polynesian men that were left stole muskets and set out to kill all of the Englishmen. Within hours, they had beheaded Martin and Mills and shot Williams and Brown dead. Christian was attacked while working in his fields, first shot and then butchered with an axe. His last words were reported to be, Oh dear. But three of the Englishmen's wives took revenge, killing two of the Tahitian men. Terora, the wife of Ned Young, beheaded a third man while he slept, and the fourth man died in a violent fight. Christian's death caused a leadership vacuum on the island. Two of the four surviving mutineers, Ned Young and John Adams assumed leadership, and some peace followed, until William McCoy created a still and began brewing an alcoholic beverage from a native plant. The mutineers began drinking excessively and making life miserable for the women. Not long after that, William McCoy committed suicide. The same year, Matthew Quintal, who'd been making threats towards Edward Young, was murdered by Young for this. Edward Young succumbed in 1800 to asthma and is the first man to die of natural causes of the mutineers. After Young's death, John Adams filled his days drinking the potent spirit distilled from the T.I. plant. Then one night, after having a dramatic hallucination, Adams underwent a transformation and became fervently religious. As leader of the community, Adams began to take his responsibility seriously. He led Sunday services and, to ensure the community's well-being, Adams saw to it that the young people cultivated the land and cared for the stock. The women played an important role in ensuring the survival of the island and even more so after the massacre. Only they could have known how best to tend gardens, catch fish and make traditional tools and canoes. They would also have had almost sole influence on the upbringing of the children. The islanders reported that they saw their first ship in 1795, but as it did not approach the island, they could not make out what nation the ship belonged to. A second ship appeared in 1801, but also this ship just sailed past the island. A third came close enough to see their houses, but didn't send a boat ashore. In 1808, the ship HMS Topaz reached Pitcairn Island and found that only John Adams, nine women, and some children were still alive. Adams was granted amnesty for his mutiny, and Pitcairn's capital, Adamstown, is named after him. As he grew older, John Adams couldn't take care of his wife Teo, who was now blind. In December 1823, the British whaler, Cyrus, arrived at Pitcairn. John Buffett, a shipwright from Bristol, took pity on Adams and requested permission from Captain John Hall to remain on the island. Buffett was given permission to stay, however his friend, John Evans, was not. But, Evans jumped ship and hid until Cyrus departed. Both men were accepted into the community and extended the island's genetic pool through being the first non-bounty, non-Polynesian settlers. Pitcairn Island became a British colony in 1838, at the same time becoming one of the first places in the world to extend voting rights to women. By the mid-1850s, the Pitcairn community was outgrowing the island, and its leaders appealed to the British government for assistance and were offered Norfolk Island. On May 3, 1856, the entire population of 193 people set sail for Norfolk. However, just 18 months later, 
17 of the Pitcairn Islanders returned to their home island, and another 27 followed five years later. In 1999, a police officer from England served on a temporary assignment on Pitcairn and began uncovering allegations of sexual abuse. When a 15-year-old girl decided to press rape charges in 1999, criminal proceedings were set in motion. In 2004, charges were laid against seven men living on Pitcairn and six living abroad. This accounted for nearly a third of the male population. On October 25, 2004, six men were convicted, including Steve Christian, the island's mayor at the time, and a descendant of Fletcher Christian. The British government set up a prison on the island because some of the men that were convicted were the only people on the island that could operate vital machinery necessary for the islanders. In 2016, Mike Warren, Pitcairn mayor from 2008 to 2013, was convicted and sentenced to 20 months imprisonment for possession of child pornography. As of 2021, the total resident population of the Pitcairn Islands was 47. A diaspora survey projected that by 2045, if nothing were done, only three people of working age would be left on the island, with the rest being very old. In addition, the survey revealed that residents who had left the island over the past decades showed little interest in coming back. So the future of Pitcairn Island doesn't seem that bright. Even though this video ended on a bit of the darker side, I hope you found this presentation interesting, and if you did, please like, subscribe, and share this video. And please leave a comment below on what your thoughts are on this story, and please check out some of my other videos on this channel and see if you find other topics that you find interesting. And I hope to see you in the next one.